And now, it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Jeff Canarsie. And welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. We are going to cover the three Colombo Wars uh, in depth as as much as we can. Uh, there's obviously going to be some some things we're not going to jump too far into, including uh, Greg Scorpa. Uh, just because if we do that, then we're going to get it. it just it, it's better if we cover it. Uh, from the aspect of of why the war happened and, and what was going on, if we get into the the absolute finer details of each uh, participant in that, we're going to be here for days. So we're going to go ahead and start. So, uh, of all the crime families uh, that we discuss on this show, uh, usually the two families that have the most insane amount of problems usually fall into two categories: the Bonanos, who have had problems going back to Joe Bonanno. Uh, obviously, know about Joe Pistone, uh, then Joey Messino. Uh, and they've had their share, their, their fair share of problems with informants. Uh, the Columbos, on the other hand, uh, have been fighting each other since the beginning of the foundation of the family. Uh, most of the Colombo problems go way, but way back to overbearing bosses, uh, in many ways, uh, versus young upstarts uh, who want to take over the family. It seems to be the only family that really has this sort of inner turmoil brewing nonstop. Uh, it's amazing how much Carmine Persico went through while in prison and remained in control of his family from behind the wall for 30 fucking years. Uh, what many may not know uh, is I knew Carmine Persico from the extent of exchanging letters for years with him. Uh, he was a kind guy. He was a generous guy. He was highly intelligent. Uh, John Gotti is going to play a part in this discussion. Uh, and even when Carmine had every opportunity to disparage John Gotti, at least to me, he never did. Uh, he never had a bad word to say about John Gotti to me. Uh, and we did talk about John Gotti extensively throughout the years. Uh, he was a tight lipped guy, but he was a guy who shared his thoughts on many things. Uh, he was a man's man. And I know a lot of people, uh, who came after didn't really like Carmine Persico for, for whatever reason they, they may have. But I always found him personally to be endearing, a kind person, uh, to the point. Uh, and someday I will release those letters, uh, which I'll include in a book. Uh, because he was just a, you know, a, a nice guy. I'll contain it. Also in the book will be letters uh, from Joey Merlino. Tommy Patera, Carmine Persico, Anthony Center, and others that I've known throughout the years. Uh, and so with all of that being said, I know we sort of have a, a policy on this show where we, we don't talk about John Gotti. Uh, and that's absolutely the announcement that I was going to talk about uh, is that I don't want to carry on a conversation anymore. If it's relevant to something we're talking about, I'm totally going to do it. Uh, I've, I've asked people not to ask me questions about it. People continue to do it, and that's okay. Uh, and there's no personal reason why I don't want to do it. It's just that there are so many other topics to get to. Uh, and if I have to uh, end that sort of uh, discussion with having a guest on who could talk about him in, in, in ways that nobody else ever could, then that's what we'll do. And that's what I think I'm going to lean towards. Uh, but if it's relevant to a narrative or to a story that we're talking about, of course, I'm going to bring it up. Uh, and, and most of that is just because I get the same questions asked over and over and over and over and over again. And that's all there is to that. There's nothing personal. Uh, it's, it's just the way I am with things. Uh, you can only beat a horse to death so many fucking times. All right. So with all that being said, let's get to the first Columbo War. 
Uh, the Colombo family didn't start as the Colombo family. It was known as the Profaci crime family led by Joe Profaci. Uh, the, the, the Profaci family was the last of the original crime families to form the original five. Uh, while I don't want to do a biography, uh, it's important to know who Joe Profaci was uh, because it'll explain sort of how the war begins and, and sort of his sort of character. Uh, Profaci came to the United States from Sicily in 1921, and he first settled in Chicago, believe it or not. Uh, he was pre, he pre Prior to that, he was in Sicily uh, in prison for theft. Once he gets released, he heads to Chicago. Once he's in Chicago, he opens up a grocery store and a bakery, uh, and neither one of them really made any money. So he packs his shit up, and he heads to New York where he opens an import olive oil company, uh, import-export. Uh, and, and this is where the Genco Olive Oil Company comes from in The Godfather. It was taken directly from Profaci. Uh, the difference was, though, uh, you know, Genco in the film The Godfather was actually an olive oil company, whereas Profaci, while he did import-export olive oil, he also imported narcotics. Uh, he came up underneath Salvatore Di Aquila, and once Di Aquila gets killed, Profaci was named boss of Brooklyn. He would name Sal Magliacco as his underboss. Uh, while he was not exactly unknown in Brooklyn, he mainly was able to attain status in New York City because of his family lineage that went all the way back to uh, Villa Bate in the Villa Bate Mafia. Uh, by nature, uh, you know, it was also a guy who could bridge gaps and calm waters. Uh, so as Profaci takes over, he moved in, into narcotics, the numbers racket, prostitution, and loan sharking. Uh, so much so that he, he ended up controlling different parts of Brooklyn. As 1930 hits, uh, we know that the Castellari War breaks out. Outwardly, Profaci didn't support one side over the other. Uh, but appearance-wise, uh, you know, well, let, let, me, let me step back for a second. He did support one side, uh, but tried to look at least outwardly like he remained neutral. Uh, but behind the scenes, he was uh, aligned with Salvatore Maranzano. Uh, as Luciano would dismantle both Maranzano and Masseria, then he would realign the five families, uh, and Profaci was named boss of his own family. He would align himself closely with Joe Bonanno, uh, and with Joe's son Bill marrying Rosalie Profaci, that would sort of make the two families powerhouses together, which would start to worry other mob families. Uh, it would all be pretty much all systems go till about 1960, 1961, and Profaci started to have some problems. The first issue was Profaci, by nature, was a greedy fuck. Uh, back in Sicily, gangs and the mob would charge gangsters a monthly fee, which was meant to be as like sort of a war chest. Uh, and it was meant to be put aside in case anybody got into trouble, they needed bail, they needed lawyers, or their family needed money. Uh, Profaci was charging his men, and, and keep in mind the date we're talking about, the 60s. Uh, $25 a month per member. The total income that he got from that monthly was $50,000. That should tell you the sheer size of his family. Uh, rather than use that money for the right reasons, or for at least the old school reasons, Profaci just pocketed the fucking money. And then he left his men to fend for themselves, uh, as if it wasn't his fucking problem. Those who refused to pay or complained or griped, he had killed. Uh, so he was a guy that wasn't going to fuck around, and, and he was a guy that wanted to line his pockets. There was also a hot issue with Frankie Schatz, Abba DeMarco. Abba DeMarco had a huge numbers racket in Red Hook, which brought in $2.5 million a year. Uh, Abba DeMarco was paying tribute to Profaci, who kept raising the payments. Uh, typically in the mafia, depending on who you're with, who you're under, it's 10%, 12%. It just depends. So the more rackets you have, obviously, the bigger kick up you're going to have to provide. Uh, but it got to the point where Profaci was demanding over 40% of the take, which would have been 30% higher than other bosses would ever even ask for. Uh, Abba DeMarco would go to Joe Gallo and the Garfield crew, frustrated with Profaci's greed. Gallo told Abba DeMarco to tell Profaci to go fuck himself, and that's exactly what Abba DeMarco does. Uh, the money owed uh, to Profaci began to creep up towards $50,000 in debt. Profaci approached Gallo to kill... Uh, Excuse me, let me step back for one second. So he refuses to give him money. Eventually, it starts piling up uh, close to 50000 that he owes. 
Uh, Joe Profaci, frustrated by this, goes to Joey Gallo and wants him to kill Abba Marco. He offers Gallo Abba Marco's rackets in return for the murder. Uh, when Gallo, uh, you know, uh, when Gallo did it or uh, or or subcontracted it out, it, it doesn't matter whether he did it or whether he subcontracted it out. It didn't matter. On November fourth of fifty nine, Abba Marco gets whacked coming out of his cousin's bar in Park Slope, Brooklyn. Uh, Profaci, concerned with Frankie's son still alive, ordered Gallo to then bring Frankie's son Anthony to see him. Uh, Gallo refused because he didn't agree with that anybody's son should be murdered. Uh, Profaci was absolutely fucking enraged that Gallo uh, wasn't going to comply. And so rather than give him Abba DeMarco's rackets like he promised, he basically tells Gallo to go fuck himself. Uh, so already you can see where this is going to start to head. Uh, Joe Gallo, who obviously worked as a hitman and an enforcer for Profaci, uh, was asked to hit Albert Anastasia on behalf of Carlo Gambino. Gallo, without hesitation, agreed to do it, and he hit Anastasia along with Carmine Persico. Uh, there allegedly was a payment which was owed to Gallo, which was never paid. Uh, Gallo and others had begun to resent Profaci, his greed, uh, and just the way he did overall business. So, uh, a, a full revolt sort of begins. Um, Gallo, what Gallo does at this point is he devises a plan to handle Profaci because he realized without the men around Profaci that Profaci wasn't very strong. Uh, Gallo, what Gallo does is he arranges the kidnapping of Joe Magliacco, Frank Profaci, and Salvatore uh, Musaccia, and soldier Frank uh, Scamone. Uh, and what he wanted to do was they wanted to kidnap joe profaci as well but profaci was a little smarter than that was able to uh, avoid capture and he takes off to florida and so the gallows just kidnap people and what they do is they say they want a hundred thousand dollars in return uh for their safety uh and just to 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 emphasize his point joey gallo wanted to whack one of the hostages hostages excuse me hostages <laughs> hostages wow i'm fucked today <laughs> hostages to make a point uh, but Larry Gallo sort of steps in and says, you know, Joe, you can't do that. It's going to create problems. So a couple of weeks go by. And what Profaci does is he agrees to Joey Gallo's terms. We'll give you the money. Uh, so let him go. And so Gallo lets them go. But then Profaci says, fuck you. I'm not paying you a dime. Uh, August 20th of 61, Joe Profaci orders the murder of the Gallo members, which included uh, Joseph Gelli and Larry Gallo. Gunman allegedly murdered uh, Gioli. After inviting him to go fishing, Larry Gallo survived a strangulation attempt in the Sahara Club in East Flatbush by Carmine Persico and Sally D'Ambrosio. Uh, and if you've seen The Godfather, you know what I'm talking about, because that's where this was taken from. They begin to strangle him and a cop comes in uh, and, and that's how that went. So that's why Larry Gallo always had that mark around his neck. Uh, the Gallos had previously been aligned with Persico against Profaci and his loyalists, uh, but after uh, Profaci attempted to kill Gallo, they gave him the nickname The Snake. Uh, the war would continue on, resulting in nine murders and three people disappearing. With the start of the gang war, the Gallo crew retreated uh, to what they called the dormitory. Both sides would exchange shots and murders. Uh, and here is a list of those events. Gallo would end up going to prison. Uh, and we're going to talk about all the murders here in a second. But Gallo ends, or excuse me. Gallo ends up going to prison for 14 years in 1961, which is probably the reason why he's not killed. Uh, and even with Gallo in prison, both sides would continue to shoot. Uh, even after the death of Joe Profaci in 62 and Joe Magliacco took over, they were still fighting. Uh, both Tommy Lucchese and Carlo Gambino had tried talking sense into Profaci prior to his death, asking him to retire to stop warring. But Profaci felt that Gambino and Lucchese were backing the gallows in an effort to control the family's interests and to try and rule the commission. And he was absolutely right. That's exactly what Gambino was doing. And Gambino would do this for years. Uh, so let's look at the murders here. Uh, Frankie uh, Abba DeMarco. Uh, who was the mob's Brooklyn-based numbers boss, uh, gets killed on Joe Profaci's orders for refusing to raise his tribute. Um, he was gunned down as he entered Cardadello's Tavern, uh, owned by his first cousin and fellow Profaci-made uh, guy, Joseph Cardiello. Uh, the fallout from the hit lays the groundwork for the Civil War 
in the future, which would is, is pretty much ignited by the gallows. August 20th of 61, uh, Joe Giarelli uh, disappears. Uh, and actually, in another sort of scene from the, the Godfather, a dead fish in a bundle of his clothes was thrown on the doorstep of the Gallo gang hangout to signify that Joe Jelly sleeps with a fishes. Uh, October 4th of 1961, uh, Joe Magnasco is shot to death uh, with a Profaci crime family member, Harry Fontana, by Fontana's bodyguard on a Brooklyn street corner. November 11th of 61, uh, Giovanni Garguglia and Paul Ricci are killed June 6th of 62. Uh, Joe, the Olive King Profaci, dies of gallbladder cancer. Uh, in 62, the Gallo hit team uh, of Anthony DeCola and Marco Morelli just suddenly disappear. June 6th of 63, Gallo crew uh, member Emilio Colantuano is gunned down. Uh, June 12th of 63, Vincent DiTucci is whacked in Queens. June 18th, 63, Gallo crew member uh, Alfred Mondello is shot to death. July 15th of 63, uh, Joey Gallo's bodyguard uh, uh, Ali Hassan Wafa is shot to death in New Jersey. August 9th of 63, uh, Joe Bats Cardiello is whacked in Bay Ridge. August 9th of 63, uh, Louis Mariani is killed uh, in Long Island. Uh, as Profaci, obviously, we know dies of stomach care. We know that, uh, excuse me, stomach cancer. Uh, we know that Magliaco did take on the Gallows, but after Carmine Persico was sh literally shot in 1963, Ray Patriarca steps in. And he steps in because he wants this to stop. And he forced peace amongst the warring sides. Uh, not soon after that, we know that Magliaco would be forced out of the mafia after agreeing with Joe Bonato to attempt to kill the entire commission. Uh, Joe Colombo, who was a hitman for Magliaco and Profaci, uh, basically went running to Gambino Lucchese, told them all about, and Stefano Magadino, telling them what was about to happen. And as a result, uh, for his, I guess, telling on everybody, uh, they elevated him to boss of the uh, Colombo crime family. Uh, Joe Colombo's rise to the top probably could not, you know, or, well, I don't know. Uh, you could probably argue Joe Colombo's rise to the top of that crime family probably wouldn't have happened unless he did what he did as far as running to Gambino. Uh, but he had Gambino's support. The, the problem was, or at least would be down the line, uh, that he would abandon Carlo Gambino and very quickly. So, Colombo Wars Part 2. As 1970 comes into the picture, uh, Joe Colombo began the Italian Civil Rights League, which was designed to fight discrimination against Italian Americans, while in part was a reputable cause. Uh, some of the things that Joe Colombo was doing, what he was attempting to do, and actually did, drew the ire of the mafia. Uh, it wasn't. It, it was one thing to to speak out. It was another to call the FBI out, uh, and further pushing it by organizing demonstrations outside of FBI offices. Just fucking sent Gambino and everybody else over to fucking moon. Uh, the league infuriated uh, mob bosses, including Gambino specifically. Uh, it was un. It drew unwanted attention to the mob. Uh, silently, both Russell Buffalino and Carlo Gambino had suggested to Colombo multiple times to stop, take a back seat, considering who you are. Put somebody else in charge, step the fuck away. Uh, but he wouldn't fucking stop. On June 29th of 1970, Colombo would hold his first public rally. Uh, Gambino sent out word to them, to everybody, that no mobster was to attend the rally, no mobster was to acknowledge it. No mobster was to go near it. Stay the fuck away. Uh, he also ordered that no mobster was allowed. No mafia member was allowed to openly support what Colombo was doing. They just didn't want the heat coming in. Uh, in 1971, Colombo would hold his second rally. Uh, Joseph Chico, who was a Gambino captain, was the chief organizer of the Italian right league, Rights League. But he steps down. Uh, he said he wasn't feeling well. He had bad health. Uh, and that is the reason what he, that's the reason he gave Colombo to step down. 
but effectively it was Gambino who told him, get the fuck out of this or else. He didn't want anybody attached to it. As the league began to make waves, the mob would turn its back on Colombo, specifically Buffalino and Gambino. Uh, late in 1971, Joe Gallo gets released from prison. Uh, while Gallo was in prison, he had begun to align himself with African-American gangsters, specifically narcotics mover Nicky Barnes, and he sort of taught Nicky Barnes how to organize uh, his organization like the Mafia. Gave him a lot of good advice, and Gallo also, also had thought long and hard about once he got out, what moves he might make. Uh, Gallo had long not been uh, as bigoted uh, as his counterparts, and he had ideas of organizing his crew, which would include African Americans and other ethnic mobsters. He did not see color. So once he's released, Gallo would choose not to abide by any sort of peace accord. Uh, his opinion was that just because peace had been brokered, it had been brokered uh, with him not on the streets. Therefore, it did not apply to him or his crew. Uh, once so, once he once he exits prison, uh, he expected a couple of concessions. Uh, the first thing he felt was that Joe Colombo was a fucking rat uh, that, in that he only got his position by telling on other people, which went against what Gallo believed in. The second fa sat facet of this was that Gallo was not coming out of prison and not holding a position of high standing within the crime family. Uh, he essentially wanted to come out, go back to business without any trappings. He also felt that Colombo was a soft boss and had desires in, in Gallo had his own desires to take over. And it didn't help that Gambino had reached out to Joey Gallo and told him that he would give him his full support if he went after Colombo. So Gambino's here on the back end of it, sort of poking Joey Gallo to go ahead and fuck with them. Let him do something stupid. Because they at that point, they were done with, with Joe Colombo. Uh, like I said, the mob was, was pissed off that Colombo was not listening to them, wasn't doing what they asked. Uh, and they were done warning him. The fact that Colombo pretty much spit in the face of Gambino, who elevated him and gave him his power, was enough to get him killed. But to ignore the rest of the commission was just too much. So as Gallo leaves prison, Colombo knew he might have a problem. So he invites Joey Gallo to a meeting. Colombo offered Joey Gallo a thousand dollars just to come meet him. That insulted Gallo, and he sent word that he wouldn't come. Instead, he sends word back he wanted $100,000 from Colombo or else. Uh, the move was backed by Carlo Gambino. Uh, Colombo receives that message and pretty much says, fuck Joey Gallo, I'm not giving him anything. So as the mob becomes more angry, uh, Gambino on the back end keeps pushing Gallo to incite war with Colombo. And the reason why Gambino does this is because he wants control of the Colombo crime family for commission purposes. If he and the Lucchese's are aligned, okay, and then he gets the Colombos, that's three families on the commission that can outvote the other two families. And so it's, it's a political move uh, more than anything. Uh, Gallo would like I said, when he came out, he starts shaking guys down. He starts taking over businesses. Uh, it was pretty much fairly relentless in trying to take over what he felt was his. Uh, war would be coming closer and closer. And then on June 28th to 71, Colombo was holding a rally in Columbus Circle in Manhattan. As Colombo was prepared to speak, a black guy by the name of Jerome Johnson walked up to Colombo and shot him in the fucking head three times. Seconds later, Colombo bodyguard shoot Johnson to death. Uh, the shooting obviously didn't kill Colombo, but left him paralyzed for the last seven years of his life, and he never opened his eyes or spoke again, and he dies of natural causes on May 22nd of 78. Uh, Gambino had called for the death of Colombo, and Gallo was the setup guy, uh, because Gallo had inroads to African-American hit guys and et cetera through Nicky Barnes, and that's the way that I think it went down, to be honest with you. Uh, this over the years has been argued, but the truth is Gambino was fully behind Gallo warring with Colombo and was behind calling for the murder of Colombo. And Joey Gallo was likely offered a boss position in return, but I think Gambino really had no desire to, her, to, 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 to hold firm on his deal because I think he knew that he couldn't control Gallo. He could sucker him into doing something, but I think ultimately he knew that if he didn't give it to him, there would be more problems. Uh, so what ends up happening is the Columbus would call a meeting and they would offer the boss position to Salmoneo, but he refused. 
uh, Joe Iacovelli would be named boss. And so this is where mob experts and pundits will have their debate. Uh, it was Iacovelli's decision as what to do. Uh, but many seem to believe that Iacovelli is the one who ordered Joey Gallo's death, but I'm a firm believer in that it was G Carlo Gambino who orchestrated the entire Second Colombo War. Gambino knew that the Colombos would look to rid themselves of Gallo out of fear. Uh, according to police sources, a contract was put on Joey Gallo's head in 1972. Uh, and so really what it amounts to is Gambino used Gallo to move on from Colombo, and it worked. Because now he somewhat, by proxy, can control things. Uh, Colombo was not a powerhouse. Uh, Gambino did not fear Joe Colombo or his power, but he feared reprisals from the FBI and the government. Uh, the commission had ordered and wanted Colombo dead. And with the heat and with, the Columbo's refu with Joe Colombo refusing to shut his mouth, it, it just had to be done. Uh, Gambino could have stepped in. He could have stopped Iacovelli from taking over, but he didn't. And I imagine that's because he was secretly, like I said earlier, backing Gallo and didn't want it getting out. So he used Gallo for what he needed to, to get done and then just clammed up after that. On April 7th of 1972, acting on a quick tip, four gunmen walked into Umberto's clam house in Little Italy and whacked Joe Gallo as he was dining with his family. Gallo gets shot, stumbles outside, and dies on the fucking pavement. Uh, while that should have ended the war, it really just propelled it. Uh, Albert Gallo, uh, Joey's brother, who was hell-bent on revenge, sent shooters to Las Vegas. Iacovelli, Car uh, Alphonse Persico, and Jerry Lang, Gennaro Langella, uh, were eating at the Neapolitan Noodle, which was a, a, a diner there. The hitman walked in and literally walked right past the three and shot four innocent bystanders instead. Two of them were killed. Iacovelli was so terrified he fled New York, and with Sal Mineo just not wanting any part of being in the leadership, it leaves a power void within the family. And with Carmine Persico running most of the, the, the most probable powerful crew within the family would see his opening. But he was in prison on federal hijacking at the time, so Vincent Aloy would take over the crime family. Aloy would be indicted not long after that and would turn the leadership over to Joe Brancato who really didn't want the promotion to begin with, but he only did it to keep a hold on the family until the war, war could end. Uh, the Gallows ended up splitting into two factions and were fighting one another. Peace would eventually settle as Brancato re agreed to let the beef go, and Albert Gallo and his remaining crew would be transferred to the Genovese crime family. Shortly after the peace agreement, Brancato would step down, uh, he would go over and, and take over a Long Island crew, and Carmine Persico would step in fully and take over the Colombo crime family in 1973, just as he went to prison for loan sharking and hijacking. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we are going to cover the Colombo crime family war part three. <laughs>
Welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. We are talking about the Colombo Family War, so all three of them. And we're going to start on Colombo Family War number three. Uh, so, Carmine Persico would name Thomas DeBella front boss, Anthony Abbott Marco underboss, and Alphonse Alley Boy Persico to consigliere. In 1977, DeBella would die, and Persico made another change. Uh, Persico would name Alphonse Alley Boy boss, uh, Jerry Lang or Gennaro Langella underboss, along with Teddy Persico. Uh, Langella, at that point, would take over all the construction rackets for the family and the labor rackets, specifically. Langella directly oversaw the concrete club, uh, making the Colombos a ton of fucking money. Uh, he would fully control the labor unions, including the Cement and Concrete Workers District Council Local 6A. Uh, in 1979, uh, Carmine Persco is released from federal prison, where, he would, where he'd officially take over as head of the crime family, but would be reindicted in 1980 for conspiracy and racketeering. Uh, he would get sentenced to five years in the can and would head back to prison. The family would keep moving forward, but then Persico is indicted along with Gennaro Langella and the heads of the mafia in the infamous Mafia Commission trial. Uh, narcotics trafficking, loan sharking, gambling, labor racketeer, and extortion against construction companies were the crimes that they were facing. Persico would actually defend himself in that trial and by all accounts did a really good job defending himself. The move infuriated other mob bosses who were under indictment, but Persico, while successfully arguing many motions and winning a few, Ultimately, it wouldn't be enough. The judge overseeing the case explained that he was surprised by Persico's intelligence and felt that he missed his true calling as an attorney. Seven of the defendants were convicted of racketeering on November 19th of 1986, with Persico and Langella each sentenced on January 13th of 1987 to 100 years imprisonment. Uh, in a separate Colombo trial, uh, Persco was sentenced to 39 years in prison, Langella 65 years in prison, and Alphonse Persico to 12 years uh, on November 17th of 86. Uh, Persico knew that his run at the top was over at least from being active on the streets and he has zero desire to give up power whatsoever. Uh, he would keep Alphonse in charge, but Alphonse skipped bail on a loan sharking uh, indictment and Carmine was left with installing another ruling panel to run the family. Uh, it wouldn't last long because in 1988, he dissolved the panel and named Vic Arena, uh, who at the time was a capo of Little Alley Boy's former crew in Brooklyn as temporary acting boss. Uh, Persico made it clear to Arena that he was merely a placeholder until Little Alley Boy could return to the streets. However, Persico gave Arena the power to induct new members, to order murders on his own authority, which were two things that many temporary bosses were never allowed to do. So obviously, Carmine Persico trusted him to a large extent. Now, Many people have disagreements over what led to the Third Colombo War. Uh, some believe the war began when Wild Bill Cotolo sent a hit team to attempt to kill Greg Scarpa. Some believe it was Arena on his own that attempted a coup to overthrow Persico, uh, which is what started it. While both of those are, are very relevant reasons and, and are on the spoke of a wheel of the, the reasons, uh, the person behind the scenes who totally thrust the war into full-blown mayhem was John Gotti uh, by pushing a narrative. Uh, this is something that you don't hear a lot of people talk about. Uh, and, and once again, this is sort of history repeating itself. Uh, Gotti had control pretty much at that point of the Gambinos, right? Uh, he had a lot of say over the Bonanno crime family, and he wanted the control of the Columbos as well, because just like Carlo, he wanted to stack the commission on the Gambino side of things. Uh, it didn't help that, you know, in the wind, there were things that were being beginning to be circulated that Carmine Persico was going to sort of do a Joe Bonanno uh, and either write a book or do a TV a made for TV movie about the mafia. The problem was none of this has ever been proven to be factual. Uh, it may have been a design by Orena, could have been a design by John Gotti, because on the streets, Gotti, get, Gotti begins to put out word that Persico was a fucking rat. Gotti went to Jackie D'Amico and tells him, put it out on the street that, that Persico's a rat. Also start telling people that Persico is no longer the fucking boss. Uh, you know, and Gotti would take it a step further by taunting the Columbos, uh, calling them the Cambodians. <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, I can picture John doing, oh, fucking Cambodians. <laughs> uh, Gotti would fully push Arena uh, to claim the title for himself. Uh, I don't think it's because John, him and Arena are very tight, but I think a lot of this had to do with Gotti wanted to stack the commission. 
So while Arena and Gotti, like I said earlier, were close, it was Gotti's complete desire to have the Columbos on his side of the fence uh, more than it was for Arena to become a boss. That's just the reality. Uh, so after they put it on the streets that Persica was a fucking rat and he was no longer a boss, Gotti then pushes Arena to act. Uh, with Gotti and the Gambinos on his side and tired of listening to, to orders from Persico from behind prison uh, and fully realizing once Alley Boy gets out that his reign is going to be over, he begins to make his move. So in 1990, Arena approaches the commission and he asks to be named the head of the Colombo crime family. His reasons were that Persico was going to be a rat. Uh, the commission pretty much refuses, and for the next nine months, Arena had to deal with Persico barking orders. Arena would then ask his consigliere, Carmine Sessa, who would later become a fucking rat, uh, to go out and pull the captains in the family and see who would be willing to jump ship. Now, you got to realize all that's going to get back to Persico, right? Uh, and if any of that sounds familiar to you, it, it, it should, because that's the same thing that John Gotti did before he, before he whacked Paul Castellano. So Sessa, rather than pull the captains like he was told to do, he runs to Carmine Persico and he tells him. Uh, in return, Persico orders the death of Arena. Uh, June 20th of 1991, uh, Robert Zambardi, John Pate, Hank Smurra are waiting in a car near Arena's home. Uh, the hit could not be carried out because Arena arrived earlier at his house than they thought he would. Uh, Arena actually got a look at the four guys sitting in a parked car near his house, and he immediately knew he was going to be killed. Uh, because of that, the hit team wasn't, uh, you know, able to kill him. But that's what began the civil war: the Persico faction versus the Arena faction. Uh, and almost immediately, the Arena faction would hit back at the Persico faction. Uh, in the background of all of this, Greg Scarpa, who was already a snitch, uh, but that was unknown to everybody at the time, was backing Persico. And Arena knew that. And, the, and Arena knew that if they were going to hold hold on to the reins or they were going to win, they had to kill Greg Scarpa. He was that feared. November 18th of 1991, Scarpa is in a car driving behind his daughter. Uh, the kill team blocks Scarpa's car with two vehicles of their own. Scarpa and his family managed to get away. Uh, acting boss Vic Arena had a hitman uh, of his own that was responsible for the hit on Scarpa. While Bill Cotolo uh, was one of the leaders of that, he was the guy that fired uh, you know, guns at Scarpa. Uh, they didn't get that done, but later on that day, they were able to, to catch Hank Smurra in front of a Brooklyn donut shop and kill him. Uh, November 28th and 91, underboss Carmine Sessa survives a hit conducted by the Arena faction. December 3rd of 91, Scarpa team attempts a hit on the Arena, Arena faction. Uh, Joe Tolino, the hit fails, and Genovese soldier Tommy Amato was killed instead. December 6th of 91, a Cotolo hit team assassinates Persico faction members Vinny Fasaro and Rosario Nastasa. Uh, December 8th of 91, a Scarpa hit team kills an Arena faction member, uh, Nikki Grancio. Uh, in January of 92, Vic Arena is indicted under a uh, RICO statute for murder. Uh, for seven, mo uh, seven more months, both sides would battle it out. And it would only end with Arena being arrested in New York of April 4th of 92, and he would eventually be sentenced to 100 years in prison. Uh, the last murder which put an end to the war would be the murder of Joe Scopo. Uh, after the war, members of the commission, both representatives from the Gambinos and Genovese crime family, warned the Columbos that if one more bullet flew, there was one more problem, the Columbos would be stripped of being on the commission. Uh, they also refused to take a side in saying who was right, who was wrong, and we're going to let you guys figure it out, but one more bullet flies, you guys are off the commission, and that's it. And that was bad news for them. Uh, and so here's the murder list between 91 and 93 of the Third Columbo War. Uh, Henry Schmura, uh Tommy Scars, Amato, Rosario Nastasi, Vinny Fasaro, Matero, uh, excuse me, Mateo, Spar es, excuse me, Mateo Speranza, Nikki Grancio, John Minerva, uh, Mike Imbergamo, Larry Lamps, uh, Steve Mancusi, and Joe Scopo. Sorry for the uh, stupid fucking fire truck in the background. Uh, many have speculated that Bill Cotolo wanted to take over the family for himself. Uh, and by doing Arena's bidding, that he was putting himself, you know, sort of in the right direction. 
Uh, it was after Arena goes off to prison that Catola was demoted in rank by Carmine Persico. And, and this is, I, I'll explain in the end why this is important. Uh, you know, Persico, you know, Catola took a side in it. He did what he was supposed to do. Uh, you know, Persico doesn't like what Catolo did for a bunch of different reasons, so he demotes him. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. He was, first of all, disgusted that Bill Catolo fired near a car that Greg Scarpa's granddaughter was in. You just don't shoot near a car where an infant is. Uh, and so for those that try to defend Wild Bill, you can't defend that. That's a scumbag move. Uh, there are just some things that you don't do. Uh, while Carmine Persico was sort of willing to look past all of that, the demotion was necessary to sort of keep him in line. Uh, Alphonse Persico eventually would be released, and Persico would name Cutolo underboss just as a peace sort of gesture to keep it calm. Alphonse would be indicted and arrested again, and word on the street is that Cutolo was pulling the captains in the family, the same thing Gotti did, the same thing Arena did, and Persico had enough and ordered Cutolo's death. Uh, it would be the last move that Persico needed to handle that would leave him in charge of the family uh, up until his death uh, in the last year. Uh, and, and so you see with these wars, typically, it's always a move from the inside. Uh, guys, you know, Carmine being in prison, barking orders, I'm sure got annoying for Arena. Arena makes a move, probably because he's backed by the Gambinos, and it didn't work for him. It didn't work out. He gets 100 years instead. Uh, some guys, and, and this is not a, uh, uh, this is not me judging uh, what what Arena did. I, I think left to his own devices, what other choice did he have? Uh, could he have waited and just stayed at the top and just kept everything moving? Sure, absolutely. But I think that, that Gotti suckered him. Uh, and I, I think that, had he realized he was being played, uh, then he might not have done what he did. And he certainly wouldn't do 100 years in prison. Uh, you know, you, you see a lot of stuff online. They, they talk about the murder and death of Bill Cotolo. Uh, a lot of people say he was a man's man. Uh, and he, you know, from, from everything that I've heard, he was. Uh, he was a tough guy. He was a gangster. But, you know, you start pulling captains. And you start to make waves, or at least if you attempt to start making waves or making it look like you're making waves, uh, then you're going to get killed. Uh, and there is, and, and, and I'll defend Bill Cotolo for a second here. Uh, there was also Greg Scarpa, who was playing both sides. He played both sides. He set a lot of people up. Uh, and, and so maybe, uh, I, and I can't, and I should have stated it during this show, uh, is Greg Scarpa was going back and forth and telling Persico a lot of things. Uh, and so maybe it's true that even though Bill Cotolo fired into a car or near a car with a child, that that's that's a scumbag piece of shit thing, but it is what it is, so to speak. Just, you know, uh, in hindsight. But maybe Bill Cotolo wasn't, you know, talking to captains. Maybe he wasn't being subversive. And Carmine acted out of impulse. Uh, because I've heard many stories that he wasn't, you know, that he, that he accepted the demotion like a man. Uh, and then when Ali Boy gets out, he gets up, up, bumped up to underboss. And he would have naturally probably succeeded in taking over the crime family, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, but Carmine Persico wasn't going to let anybody else be the boss of that family. Uh, and, and so I can understand the other side of that narrative. Uh, you know, was it completely necessary to kill Bill Cotolo? And that's the big question. Was that necessary? I, I don't know if it was. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, the commission was not about to, in, under any circumstance, uh, demote Carmine Persico and take, take his family away from him. I don't think that was ever going to happen. Uh, but I think that there will be those that will say that Carmine, the only reason why Carmine Persico killed Bill Cotolo is because he didn't want anybody to be acting like they were boss. He wanted to make all the decisions, all the moves uh, from prison. Uh, there have been those that, that said that they should have called the Colombo crime family the Persico crime family. Uh, and, and so those are two sides of that that sort of story. And, and I've, I've talked about Wild Bill before on this show. Uh, and I just think that if you're going to talk about it, at least give all sides to it. Uh, whether or not he was doing the things that that. Persico accused him of, 
I can't tell you. I wasn't around. I wasn't there. But I can tell you that Persico only finds out about that information from Greg Scarpa. And Greg Scarpa lied at every turn. He just did. That was that was that was his way of outmaneuvering everybody. Uh, and I think that had they waited and not killed Bill Cotolo, it eventually would have come out that Scarpa was a, an FBI informant anyway. Uh, so I'm sure that at some point Carmine was made to be a fool because he believed what Scarpa said, uh, and that's how treacherous the life is. Uh, you know, I, listen. At the end of the day, you know, people can justify murder. Bosses can justify, you know, John can bust the, to, can, can sort of justify killing Paul Castellano. But did he really need to do it? If he had just waited, Castellano was going to go to jail for the next 100 fucking years. At that point, what does he have to fear? You know, he would probably take less heat if he killed Tommy Bellotti than Paul Castellano. But, you know, it was the time period. A lot of people were nervous. There were drug indictments. So, you know, sometimes guys react and they do what they got to do to take over. Uh, but I don't think we've seen any boss other than Carlo Gambino who took out another boss and then was able to stay on the streets for another 30 fucking years or whatever the fuck the case may be. Uh, that was a little bit more calculated. A different time period, too. And so I'm always interested... And sort of looking at the, the, the sort of fractures in a family when somebody's killed. Uh, you know, killing Bill Cotolo didn't change a narrative. It, it just made things worse because then everybody else coming up back uh, behind him, I don't think was any smarter or any tough than Bill. But it is what it is. This is what these guys do. Uh, it's how they handle business. And, you know, I wasn't there. The cops weren't there. Fucking book, book authors weren't there. We don't know. We just don't know. All we can go off of uh, is what's been reported. And a lot of times stuff that's reported just sadly isn't fucking accurate. Uh, but the Columbos have been, you know, we're a mess for a very long time. And, you know, I know I opened a show saying you no know, nice things about Carmine because to me, he was a nice guy. Uh, he really, really was. Uh, but, you know, outward appearances are always everything. People are always going to tell you what they want to tell you and hold back certain stuff. I always felt he was very honest with me. Uh, and he had to do what he had to do that what he thought was best for his family. And that's just the reality of it. I, I don't even necessarily agree with some of the stuff he did, but that's why he is who he is. And that's why I am who I am. Uh, you know, so that's the, the three Columbo's wars. Uh, what we are going to do next week, we're going to go back to our biographies. Uh, uh, we're going to do some Sicilian guys, uh, some guys from Naples. We're going to talk about some other people. But if you have any suggestions, and yes, I know people are going to say the Detroit show. Believe me, it's coming. Uh, there's a million topics to cover, a million different ideas. So if any of you have any ideas or any topic of a show you'd like to discuss, then reach out to me at mobtalkradioshow at gmail.com. Uh, even if you have any thoughts or you have questions, if you have questions about Philadelphia or you have questions about what's going on in New York, uh, feel free to reach out. Mob Talk Radio Show at gmail.com. Now, as far as the guests, before I get out of here for today, uh, I am going to try by next week to have a whole list of people that are coming on the show. Uh, I originally was going to have on Greg DeVita, uh, who was very tight with Sonny Francis. Uh, but I have decided after a lot of thought, I'm not going to do that. Uh, the reason why I don't uh, I, is I have some doubts about some things. Uh, you know, I, Greg, I, I don't even really know Greg. He seems like a decent guy, but there are some things he's put out that just aren't true. Uh, and, you know, I particularly, while I could have a guy on who could say nasty things about Michael, that's just really not what I want to do. Uh, I, I just don't want to have a guy on that's got a beef against Michael. It just doesn't, it, it's just not what I, I don't want to bring on somebody who wants to bitch about somebody else. Uh, and I just think that uh, anybody who partakes in a hate group about me or is a member of that group, I'm not having on my show. Uh, I don't know why that's the case with this guy. Uh, I attempted to, to have him on the show a bunch of times and he just didn't respond to stuff. So uh, listen, if you, if, if you're somebody, an author that wants to be on my show, send me an email, mobtalkradioshow at gmail.com. And I'll at least talk to you about it and see if we can work something out. Uh, there's a couple of authors I really want to have on. I will never have Anastasia on my show. Get that fucking out of your head right now. That's never going to happen. 
And that's because he's not going to answer questions honestly. And that's just the truth. Uh, and, and I feel bad because at one point I really liked George Anastasia. I loved his books. I thought his books were great. Then he wrote a live filled book. That was the end of it. And then he did something else. But I don't want to get into that fucking rabbit trail. So we're going to try to have on some people. Uh, you know, I, I typically would like to have people on that I show. Because a lot of people ask me, well, what types of people do you want to have on? I'm not going to have a rat on my show. That's never going to happen. Uh, that's just my role. I don't do it. Uh, but I wouldn't mind having people on that related to people that can tell a story that sort of gives you an inside look. Because I think a lot of the things that are out right now specifically uh, – all they do is glorify it. Oh, I murdered this one. I murdered that one. Oh, I fucked this one in the back of the skull. You know, just all this fucking nonsense. But rarely does anybody talk about what the family goes through or what the grandkids go through or what, what people have to go through. Uh, I've always said it and I'll always say it. That, that anybody related to anybody should not have to suffer the sins of that person. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not the way media works. That's not the way social media works. Uh, and just some of the stuff I see is pretty disgusting. So, you know, I, I typically want to have people on that, that aren't there to push anything. They're not there to push a narrative. They're just there of, hey, this is my fucking story. Uh, this is this was who my father was. This is who my uncle was. Uh, those are the types of conversations that I want to have. Uh, I don't need to, to bring some jerk off on the show and let him, oh, I killed 50 people and then I killed 40 more. And I was the biggest thing since John got it. Like, I don't need that shit. Uh, they have their own platforms. They have their own people that listen to their nonsense. Uh, and I just want to keep it fresh. So hopefully next week when we do the show, I'm going to have some more. Uh, I'm going to really try to have a definitive list of who we're going to have.